www.thepeacefulinstitute.org or post them in the chat room and Anastasia will make sure they get to me. Now, th there's so much going on in the world, an incredible uh, picture between war, depression, bank collapses, empty promises from people like Fed Chair Jerome Powell. But I, I want to start with one that I think is at the center of things, which is the contrast between the speech given by President Putin for the Victory Day celebration in Moscow and the continued efforts of the NATO, European Union, U.S. political establishment to keep this war going, turning it into a permanent war. Uh, Putin's speech to the Victory Day celebration uh, was honoring those who fought as allies in World War II to defeat the Nazis. And then he was sharply critical of the Western oligarchs today who are acting in the same way the Nazis did in World War II. But then, and critical of Western oligarchs by name. But when you talk about Western oligarchs, we had this spectacle of a press conference of British Foreign Secretary Cleverly uh, meeting with Anthony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, where Cleverly said, look, even if there aren't gains or significant gains in the current uh, uh, spring offensive, we're going to stick with Ukraine. We have to stick with Ukraine. Blinken, when he was discussing the leaks from the Pentagon, said, well, those leaks are back in March. Things are much different now. Ukraine is in much better shape. In other words, a commitment to permanent war. And Biden yesterday announced another either 1.2 or 1.4 billion in aid, dollars in aid to Ukraine. So Helga, what are your thoughts on, on this situation right now and the contrast between Putin's appeal to a human race fighting against corruption and, and for justice and the continued war talk coming from Washington and European capitals? Well, on the one side, naturally, it's very dangerous, but on the other side, it's also a coloss on clay flea feet. I mean, in a certain sense, you know, whenever you're talking about the British right now, I don't get the picture out of my head of this uh, royal wedding. Um, you know, actually, if you if you want to know how outdated this policy is, just look at this uh, ceremony. Uh, with an unhappy looking King Charles and an even more unhappy looking Queen Camilla. I mean, this was a medieval farce, you know, this is, uh, and it, you know, it, it, with it goes a denial of reality because, you know, they, they keep saying uh, that, you know, Ukraine will win this war, we just have to send more weapons. I mean, the reality is that the Pentagon leaks uh, made it very clear, the poor Ukrainian people are being slaughtered. They are being used up until the last Ukrainian. And the reason why this much uh, discussed Ukrainian uh, spring offensive is not really visible is because you can pump as many weapons into Ukraine. But the fact is there is a demographic reality. Uh, you know, sure, you can send mercenaries uh, pilots and so forth, but you know the the West is really not that strong. I mean, the the underlying weakness is the collapse of the financial system. The U.S. banking crisis is is fully going on. Um, you know, the reason why they can't send enough ammunition is because you know they did too much deindustrialization to even keep a war going. So I mean, it's all. You know, naturally, it has a lot of uh, human sacrifices and human collateral damage, as they call it. But it is not a winning proposition. So I think that, you know, the sooner more people come and stand up and say this has to stop, the better. You know, the, the military parade in Moscow, I watched uh, part of it. And, you know, the Western media, again, they say, oh, they didn't show tanks, they didn't show this. But frankly, you know, people better should have looked at the ICBM nuclear loaded missiles. Uh, <clears throat> this is what will ruin the world civilization if we don't get out of this dynamic. So in a certain sense, I, I find these discussions of Blinken cleverly, you know, in a certain sense, yeah, sure, they re-emphasize re the uh, 
the special relationship, the undying brotherhood between the U.S. and Great Britain. But it's not it's not a winning proposition, and it is uh, definitely not the 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 thing which will shape the future in any positive way. So, you know, in a certain sense, it's it's um, talk of a past dying empire. Now, you mentioned that you referred to the banking crisis. Uh, we do have a question from a retired banker from Texas who has been following us for years. And in his comments, he said, I remember LaRouche talking about restoring Glass-Steagall many, many years ago. I was for it then. I'm not so sure right now. And he asks, what makes you so certain that in this era of AI, digital currencies, and, and uh, internationalization, what makes you so certain that Glass-Steagall could work? Well, because it's the only way how you get back to to the providing of credit to the physical economy. I mean, people argue that you need derivatives, but derivatives originally were only meant as an insurance for actual, you know, trade, not derivative upon derivative upon derivative, not this whole casino uh, economy which has evolved out of it, where monetarist values are being, you know, they have basically taken on a life on their own. So we have to go back to an original idea that you need credit to finance production. That's it. You know, you don't need you don't need an elaborated system of financial tradings. And you know, the majority of countries are as a tendency moving in that direction already because you know countries like China are prohibiting speculation in monetary values. Uh, they discourage investment in these things by making specific laws. So I think you know the AI has no uh, impact on it because it's a question of, of governments making legislation which you know basically protects the common good. If you don't manage to go in this direction, you know, then you you end up in a dark age and possible World War Three. So I think class legal is as valid as it always was, and you know, the idea of having capital control on the part of some countries is de facto already doing the same thing. Okay, now we have a question from Go Leng Zeng who says the American economy looks like it's collapsing soon. The high inflation does not seem to be going away. Yet the government still has the money, has the ability to send Ukraine more aid. Can the citizens afford to pay for that? And, and, when, will the, and uh, when will this money to Ukraine be too much for the common citizen? Well, when the common citizen has enough of having not adequate infrastructure, of not having adequate transportation, of being sick and tired of the mass shootings in the United States, which are a result of a general economic and cultural collapse. I mean, the United States is in a terrible condition. The, you know, you, maybe you don't see the connection between the mass shootings and, you know, the general condition of society. But why is it that so many children, so many people are, are you know, driven to the point of, of committing these kinds of acts of insanity. It is because the society is no longer functioning. And I think the, the moment has to come where the ordinary citizen not only says, you know, that the money which is being wasted now on the military industrial complex, you know, the only people who get rich are those who, who own these uh, factories or these you know, firms of um, the military industrial complex. But, you know, people have to demand that the United States is being rebuilt. You know, the the, the roads in, in some parts of the United States are, are horrible. If you if you drive with a car uh, in New Jersey, you know, on the up, opposite side of Manhattan, it's a, it's a miracle that, that people are not, you know, uh, running into mass accidents every every hour because the condition of the roads is so poor. There is not one fast train uh, track in the United States, not one. I mean, the United States is in urgent 
uh, demand for repair. And I think, you know, the American people must really get their act together and demand a change. And here's a question from uh, someone who doesn't want to be identified, but uh, is asking about your thought on the European Space Agency's Jupiter Moon uh, program. Uh, a mission was just launched last month to travel to the moons of Jupiter and, and uh, do various kinds of experiments and, and observations to discover whether there's water there. Uh, and the questioner says, wouldn't this be an ideal opportunity for cooperation between Europe and China instead of the way the EU seems to be going, looking for a war with China? And he also then asks, could you speak about the idea of the extraterrestrial imperative, uh, which I know you and Lyndon uh, are full believers in. Isn't that the way to inspire happiness and, and uh, joy about the future? Yes, <clears throat> I think that aspects of the ESA, the European Space Agency, are actually the most healthy uh, thing which is still happening in Europe because it is, uh, you know, future oriented and oriented towards the creativity of uh, mankind. I think the idea of uh, building a village on the moon is uh, very inspiring. And indeed, yes, I think it, it, it absolutely would make sense that the ESA and the Chinese Space Agency work together, you know, like also with the Russian Space Agency. That That is the area where we absolutely have to come to a joint cooperation. Now, I believe that, you know, the move of man into space is what will make the difference between childhood and adulthood. You know, just recently there was the anniversary of Gagarin's first uh, travel into orbit. And, you know, there are many people, including myself, who believe that actually the ability of man to lift off the surface of Earth was the real breakthrough. Uh, naturally, the landing on the moon was another one, but you know the fact that man could overcome gravity and actually lift himself up into space. I mean that that was a gigantic step, and I think you know Kraft Erika, who is the author of this notion of the extraterrestrial imperative, he is a visionary who is unmatched to the present day because he not only discussed, you know, the technical and practical aspects of space science and space travel, but he discussed especially the impact this would have on the outlook of mankind, you know, because, I mean, he told us this, you know, he was in the board of the Schiller Institute and he was a good friend of us. And, you know, he told us uh, when he moved with his family uh, after the war from Germany to the United States, he he experienced how the environment shapes the identity of people. So he said he and his wife still were more or less German in, in the heart, but when they moved to the United States, they became a little bit of both. Then their children who were born uh, mostly in the United States, I think, uh, they were already American, but they still had a lot of the, you know, European German cultural tradition. The the children of those children, the the you know the grandchildren, were totally American, and all of them had a completely different mindset. And he used that as a pedagogy to say what will happen to men when you actually live on the moon for longer periods of time when you travel finally to the Mars, you build a city on Mars and even beyond, eventually in the future you will have interstellar space travel. It will change the mindset and the attitude of human beings. We will stop thinking about having idiotic wars against each other because we will realize that you know, in order to survive in space, the humans have to conquer so many challenges that we have to work together. And, you know, when you are in space, you have to be rational. You cannot go with a spaceship uh, to the moon or somewhere else or to a space station and then have a freak out. You just say, I don't like it anymore. I get out here and go somewhere else. 
you can't do that because you won't enjoy it very much because you need oxygen, you, you need all kinds of support systems. So I think, you know, the fact that you will be forced to be rational, that you will conquer completely new horizons, that you will discover questions you, you have not even the knowledge, the pre-knowledge of right now, it will transform human beings and make them so much more rational, so much more creative, so much more adult. And that I think the perspective of ending war will only become really possible through space travel. So I think that the importance of all of these projects is enormous. I fully agree that the extraterrestrial imperative is an imperative. You're listening to Helga Zepp LaRouche, the chairwoman of the Schiller Institute. And we have a few more questions for you, Helga. Here's one that I found quite interesting. It comes from a friend from Algeria who commented that the Algerian president has now said that he wants his country to become a member of BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa Alliance, or BRICS Plus, as, as we've been calling it, as there are so many nations that want to join. He said that it's his view that this is the way that Africa should go, the, the, the person from Algeria. But he said they keep seeing people from the European Union coming to Algeria saying they should be a leader in solar technology, that they should trade their oil and natural gas to Europe in return for solar technology so they could blaze a new future with solar energy. And he wanted to know what you think of that proposal. In particular, he was referring to Ursula von der Leyen and the gateway, the, the European Union's gateway program. Well, <clears throat> the gateway uh, is a uh, Luftnummer. Uh, it's a, I don't know this word in English now. It's a, an empty shell uh, because it only suggests uh, tiny investments and then expects private investments to do the rest. Nothing will come out of it. It's like the Juncker plan before. This was also announced with big fanfare, and it's geopolitically motivated. It's supposed to be, you know, to counter the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, to be part of the so-called de-risking, what a word, you know, de-risking uh, the uh, ties with uh, China. But the reality is, you know, uh, because the Europe, Europe is so much on this green reset, uh, they are destroying our economy, I must say. The EU right now is is involved in, in an absolute uh, self-destruction. The German economy, the bottom is falling out. Mittelstand is leaving right and left. Uh, large industries are being forced to either go to the United States or to go to China because of the exorbitant energy prices. Europe right now is on a course of self self-motivated suicide. It's disgusting. I think we should leave the EU. The EU is falling apart. The majority of its citizens don't like it. Uh, I just got recent figures, which I don't have now in front of me. Um, let me just see if I find it here quickly. Um, no, I don't have it here right now. Wait a second. Uh, according to the British Daily Mail, and they are not, you know, they are not exactly um, on the side of uh, what not. They, they basically say that the five countries may leave the EU. Uh, 63%, 60% per of all Greeks have mistrust in Brussels and don't, don't think the EU has a good future. That's still the, uh, you know, the late effect of the 2009 debt crisis and the way the Troika treated Greece. The, the Troika did so much damage to Greece that, you know, they're, they're ruined in their relationship forever. Uh, then uh, Italy, 50% don't trust the EU. France, 57% don't trust the EU. 44% uh, of Hungary, which is the country which is most bashed by the EU, um, don't like the EU and would like to leave. So that's not a good situation. And what is happening right now is the EU is uh, becoming a dictatorship. Um, you know, the EU, they, they, 
there was a referendum in France, uh, in Holland in 2005, and they lost, you know, people didn't want to have a constitution of the EU. Then they moved it to Lisbon, which was a trick, so that they wouldn't have to have a referendum. Um, they turned it into a, a treaty, which didn't require that. So there was already no, no majority support for that construct. And now they want to change even that. They want to uh, change the demand for a unanimous decision on important issues like foreign policy into what they call a qualified majority. That means that, you know, if you have a couple of countries who want to push something through, like Germany, France, Italy, and you have smaller countries who don't agree, it doesn't matter, it will be put uh, through and it will make be made obligatory anyway. Now that is really bad. This is directed especially against Hungary because Hungary did not want to go along with the sanctions against Russia, not with the weapons to Ukraine, and they want to have basically an end to this war uh, and have a negotiated uh, solution. Now they will be rolled over and I can foresee that if this dictatorial character of the EU is continuing, the EU will fall apart. And frankly, you know, I think NATO has become an aggressive alliance, which is, uh, you know, completely changed from, you know, the Cold War period where they were supposed to be a defensive alliance against the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union no longer exists. And now the NATO is become global NATO. And von der Leyen has made uh, an agreement between the EU and NATO, whereby a member country of one is automatically linked to all aspects of the other alliance. So the EU and NATO are officially completely interwoven and becoming more and more a dictatorship. Uh, have I been asked if I agree that, uh, that uh, Ukraine should become a member of the EU? No, but by implication, because of this connection between the EU and NATO, it is a trick to include Ukraine into NATO, which is the tripwire for World War III. Now, von der Leyen went to Kiev the other day and offered uh, Ukraine to become a member of the EU as quickly as possible. Has there been a vote about that in the national parliaments? No. Has there been a referendum anywhere? No. So I think this EU is becoming right now a, a very questionable uh, thing and the more countries decide to leave it and form in the tradition of Charles de Gaulle uh, a partnership of perfectly sovereign fatherlands who work together, that's not, not uh, prohibited, uh, that's not made impossible, you can work together in a partnership of countries, you don't need a supranational bureaucracy. Uh, so, you know, my question, or my answer to your question is, don't do it. It is, um, it is uh, tying Algeria into something which has no future. I think Algeria should absolutely pursue the membership uh, in the BRICS. And I think the more African countries do that in the short term, the better. Uh, speaking of the EU and Germany, uh, we have a question about the cancellation of the trip by Lindner from the Schultz cabinet to China. Uh, the, the attempt by the German government to somehow uh, find a middle way between the EU anti-China policy and the attempt to maintain some kind of relationship seems to be not working, especially after Baerbock's, the foreign minister's trip to China. So do you, or do you know anything about this cancellation of Linder's trip and what that could mean? Well, I think it's a clear message, you know. I, I, there was another minister of the Scholz cabinet who just went to Taiwan. And obviously this is regarded by China as an unfriendly act. So since their patience seems to be uh, getting shorter these days, I think it's a clear message you know, that they will not take any insight uh, forever and that, uh, you know, they, they don't need uh, this kind of uh, behavior. 
So I think that China was really trying very hard to have a positive relationship with um, uh, with uh, <clears throat> the EU, but you know, von der Leyen is uh, made this very offensive speech before she went to China, and that has been uh, noted uh, very clearly. That was also clearly expressed in the different treatment she got as compared to President Macron, who had taken her basically with with him, who got a red carpet treatment while von der Leyen was uh, basically told more or less, you know, to meet with not so important uh, officials. So I think this is really <clears throat> stupid because the economic momentum is in Asia. Uh, if you go to China, they have growth rates that, you know, 5%. Other Asian countries have similar growth rates. And, you know, Europe is being driven right now into the ground. And the more uh, European politicians capitulate to the pressure which comes from the United States and Great Britain to actually to break with China. And, you know, this de-risking is just the soft, softest way of, you know, making it sound a little bit less uh, traumatic. It's really a no-win proposition because the majority of the world is forming a new uh, economic system, the BRICS Plus. 19 countries have applied for membership. There is a new development bank which has been initiated by President Lula uh, with Dilma Rousseff as the new director. Uh, this bank, according to Lula, has the potential to become the great bank of the global south. This is very much in the tradition of the International Development Bank proposed by Linda LaRouche in 1975. And, uh, you know, the future is there and the Europeans should not go in the direction of... I mean, you can cause enemyship uh, hostility by, you know, behaving hostile. Uh, China has not done anything to, to cause that to happen and... I think von der Leyen is just a puppet of, of the Anglo-American empire. Now, Helga, here's a question from the chat. Uh, what's the best way to educate people uh, to get them to understand the whole situation? A documentary, a series of short videos that focus on a specific aspect of history, economics, politics, etc. What's your view of the best way to educate people? Well, I think, you know, given the fact that the mass media, the MSM, the mainstream media, are in the hands of the NATO forces, the Mickey Met, uh, Mickey Met, as uh, Ray McGovern calls it, uh, the military industrial congressional intelligence uh, media, uh, probably forgot something complex, you know, they are not trying to educate people. Um, most media have a spin in things they report. It's uh, it's becoming uh, an absolute noteworthy phenomena that you can trust the public media in Germany, for example, the you know the public media like the first and second TV channel. They they always twist things in order to make it fit the propaganda of NATO. So it is a difficult thing, but I think the idea of having, uh, you know, documentaries, historic ones, cultural ones, short videos to get people's interest vetted, um, absolutely. I think we need classes. We could have more like a online university. There are many YouTube presentations, obviously. But I think one should probably think of, you know, really creating more like a, a Schiller Institute University lectures, La Rouge in the universities, get more people to study the works of La Rouge. We have the La Rouge Lib uh, Legacy Foundation, where we put all the videos and all the writings of La Rouge. The Schiller Institute website could probably be expanded for that we need more people to help. I think we need to have a real counter-offensive uh, against the dumbing down of people by the mastery media. 
it, 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 it is becoming a, an urgent question of the time. So my short answer is yes, given the present circumstances, at least in the Western countries, we probably have no other way than to do it the way you say. Well, your answer reminds me of something your husband once said, which is that, remember, the mainstream flows directly to the sewer. Now, I, I think we have time for one more question, which goes back to this question, the, the, your discussion of Kraft Erika. It's from someone who's organizing a conference in France who is asking about uh, the discussion in a recent conference when the Chinese official Wen Yi spoke about how every country should be able to have development uh, and, and what what happens if every country is developing? What's the where do the where do you go next? And and this person suggests that this is the idea of the galactic imperative that the next step would be for every nation to think about the extraterrestrial imperative. But if you have something else on that, his, his question is, if every nation is starting to develop, what's the, what, is there a limit to what could happen? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, I mean, look, what is the situation? You have a certain number of people who go to universities in, in the north, global north, but are these universities geared towards unleashing the creativity of the students? For the most part, not. Uh, <clears throat> what are the subjects you study? They all have to do with the neoliberal economic model or the, you know, if you study to become a doctor, you have to, you know, fit the privatized health system, which means you spend 80% or so of your time in filling out papers and you know it's not really geared to the best possible use of your talents everything which has to do with uh, banking accounting management you know all of that kills creativity uh, it turns you into a brotgelehrte of the worst kind into a bread fat uh, a scholar as Schiller calls them However, you have a certain number of people who can become creative musicians, for example, classical musicians, or you have, you know, certain scientists. I'm not saying there is no creativity. There is a certain amount. But in the ter in, from the standpoint of the 8 billion people who are living on Earth right now, it's a tiny percentage. Uh, maybe in other countries it's a little bit better. For example, China is spending a lot on education, on excellence in education. Other countries are going in this direction, but it's still, you know, compared to the billions of people who are living in utmost poverty, uh, who don't have enough to eat, who have no clean water, who have no time to study because they have to carry, you know, to care for their livelihood. So the human species is not well educated. Just imagine if every child would have the opportunity from an uh, age as a tiny baby on uh, to be in the best possible environment, you know, to have a loving family, to have uh, enough food, to have good health care, to in the beginning learn by playing, by, you know, allowing the child to develop its imagination, by, you know, bringing out the creativity in play. That's the first step. Then as school begins, you know, you would have access in the most best way to all the natural sciences, universal history, poetry, other arts. Uh, you learn singing, you learn to play in an orchestra, you do space studies, you know. In any case, the best possible way so that the all the creative potential of that baby and child and young person would be developed. Many, many, many people would become absolute creative geniuses. They would have time to develop their character, to be beautiful. I think still one of the highest ideals is the beautiful soul of Friedrich Schiller, you know, the person who educates his or her emotions in such a way that you can blindly trust them because you will not have a freak out and say, ah, I want to do this now. No, you would be uh, joyful, you would be, 
you know, a good painter, a good artist, you would discover things, you would lifelong learning, lifelong self-improvement. Well, if all the people would eventually do that, you know, they would relate to each other in a completely different way, like Einstein and Max Planck, or like Wilhelm von Humboldt and Schiller, or, you know, Körner, or many other people. You read the letter exchanges between such great minds of the past, you get an inkling of what a human relationship can be, that you really relate to the best part of the other person, the most creative aspect of the other person. We, we can form a human society, which right now we are so absolutely distant of. You, you know, if you look at what happens to our culture, you know, even in Europe, these mass shootings now have started. Um, and that's a reflection of complete despair and, and, and hatred and the opposite of what I'm talking about. So I think we have to fight for a renaissance of, of our human species. I think it's more urgent than ever. And there is no limit. Uh, I think that's the beauty that in the same way, like we obviously are living in an expanding universe. We know for sure two trillion galaxies exist. Well, if you think how big our galaxy is, and then think two trillion galaxies. Well, if we start to think about um, populating first nearby space, and then as we develop other propulsion methods like thermonuclear fusion, we can think about, you know, colonizing space in general. Um, there is no limit. Absolutely not. Helga, I know you're short on time, but someone sent a question and asked if you could just give a short answer. This is from the UK. Uh, he, he writes, it seems you think the monarchy has no useful role in our modern world. I agree with you. So do many young people in the UK. Do you see any possibility to get rid of the monarchy in the near future? Well, it's obviously up to the British uh, people, but, you know, I mean, when I watched, and frankly, I did not watch very long, but long enough to get an impression of this royal wedding, I, I said, this can't be true. Are they serious? You know, obviously they were serious, and, and obviously the 2,000 um, people who were present in one form or another in this thing took it serious, otherwise they would have broken out into laughter. But, you know, what is at the bottom of that is a self-deification, which is completely unnatural. Uh, I can only suggest that you read the Letters uh, to a Russian Prince by Joseph de Maistre, uh, who was um, at times an ambassador in St. Petersburg. And he wrote, um, you know, about the, you know, idea behind this idea of high nobility, monarchy, and so forth, which is the idea that only the born noble, you know, nobility, and especially the monarchies, but it's also higher nobility, they are the only people who are good and the mass of the people are evil and that's why you need a Leviathan, a, a hegemon who has to keep control and, you know, control these uh, evil people by fear, you know, by installing fear so that they obey the law. What a terrible conception and what a, what a completely out of proportion uh, self-deification, I think this is incredible. It's, it's, uh, racism is too mild a form. It's, uh, it's, you know, the idea that there are some people who are born better than other people, I think it is up to the British people to reject such an inhuman conception. And I can only encourage you to do it soon for the benefit of us all. <laughs> I'm sure my friend will appreciate that answer. So Helga, thank you for joining us today. And we'll look forward to our discussion next week. Yes, and be good until next week and better.